Hello? Okay. I apologize. I, we took him out to dinner, and uh, we had a few parking problems, so this is my fault. If you're restless and irritated, you can blame it on me. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming out tonight, especially seeing as it's the, the last day of Indian summer, and it's gotten remarkably chilly. Five or maybe six years ago, I was spending the weekend with a friend in Chicago. My first morning there, I went in to use his shower, turned on the water, got ready to jump in, and there in the back of the toilet was a copy of My Life in Heavy Metal. <laughs> and this is true. I leaped through it, just thinking, you know, I'm glancing through, what's, what's my friend's toilet reading? And I stopped at this passage. In the dim, yeasty haze of after parties and the stoned vista of Hope Hill, on the cruddy avenues of our college town, Joe came to, bear, came to me bearing gifts. A fresh baked loaf of bread, a Mardi Gras necklace, bearing her smile and plump white breasts, she let me have her way with her. Though, I was never quite sure in the end if she wasn't having her way with me. At night, she kissed my body all over, and in the morning, she made me omelets. It was like having happy birthday sung to me each day, ecstatic and disquieting. And that's all it took. I was hooked. I sat down on the toilet, and I continued to read long after the water in the shower went cold. Read, in fact, until my friend Ahmad's girlfriend smacked the door with a high heel shoe and called me an asshole for using all the water. What took me in so quickly, I think, was the utter lack of pretension and the honest, open quality of the voice. I heard it rather than read it. I think you all will find tonight's reading equally as engaging, and I'll be surprised if many of you don't feel the same poll I did to keep reading on yourselves long after the shower goes cold. Steve Allman was raised in Palo Alto, California, and spent seven years as a newspaper reporter in El Paso and Miami. I think Palo Alto is long stick, is that the translation? Big, Big stick. He has been writing fiction for more than a decade, and his work can be found in all kinds of magazines, big and small. He is an enthusiast of the literary magazine. He's in anthologies and collections. In fact, he will have a story in the upcoming edition of Flyway. His story collections, My Life in Heavy Metal and the Evil B.B. Chow, received enthusiastic critical acclaim, and his nonfiction book, Candy Freak, has earned him something of a cult following among the sweet set. Most recently, he's partnered up with Juliana Bagat, excuse me, Bagot, to write a novel and judged a bad erotica contest for Nerve.com magazine. I feel like I could go on and praise you, Steve, to the ceiling for the next 20 minutes, but it's not fresh air. And when I finish this sentence, you guys will be able to judge for yourselves. Welcome, Steve Almond. Always so strange. Uh, whenever there's a reading, nobody ever sits in the front row, except for David, who's drunk. Nobody ever sits in the front row. It's this. I mean, there's, there's somebody literally. The guy in the cat. We've got to be a hundred yards apart right now. <sighs> so fucking sad. All right, uh, because really, I they had the problem with the spitting, and I it's all taken care of. I wear the night guard. I don't spit anymore. Oh well. All right, um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read uh, some some very short, uh, very sexual passages. So if anybody is uh, troubled by that, sorry. Um, from my life in heavy metal. Then I'll read an essay, a little piece of nonfiction, and then I'll read a very short story from uh, from the evil BB Chow. I, this whole thing, from start to finish, will probably take two and a half hours. <laughs> a kid. As I care. Uh, let's see. All right, so here's a little scene. I was asked specifically to read this little scene from My Life in Heavy Metal. All you need to know is that uh, Claudia is kind of the other woman and she's a lifeguard. And our narrator is involved with a woman named Joe. 
actually Dave mentioned. Claudia came, uh, called me at work the next day. She wanted to have dinner on Saturday night. Sure, I said, where do you want to go? She giggled, why don't you make me dinner? Claudia showed up in a black dress and blue eyeshadow. Her, her voice seemed oddly pitched, a bit too exuberant. She gulped at her wine and let the hem of her dress ride up her legs, which looked polished. I didn't have much to say, nor did she. We were just waiting around for the alcohol to spring our bodies. You know, I guess I should pause and explain that occasionally when young people have alcohol, it serves as a kind of enabler for sexual activity. I just want to clarify, because sometimes there's confusion on that point. We moved to the couch where we leaned and leaned and finally fell against one another sloppily. I slid my chin down her belly. She was so much smaller than Joe, almost delicate, but when her knees slipped behind my head, they clamped me so hard, my bottom row of teeth bit into the underside of my tongue. I could taste my own blood in this mix with the slightly acrid taste of her. Gradually, her legs sagged to the bed, and her pelvis vaulted into the air. I followed her up, pressed harder, and suddenly there was a warm liquid coming out of her, a great gout of something, sheeting across my cheeks, down my shin, splashing onto the comforter. I figured at first she had urinated, but there was simply too much fluid coming out of her. By the time Claudia had regained her wits and lowered herself to the bed, the puddle on my comforter was two feet across. Are you okay? I said. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I also want to note how very careful I am with my dialogue and how, my, how, how deeply effective it is. Let me repeat that line. Are you okay? I said. Claudia, Claudia nodded bashfully and stumbled to the bathroom. My second theory was that as a lifeguard, pool water had somehow accumulated inside her and been released when her internal muscles were perfectly logical, <laughs> when her muscles relaxed. But the liquid was as tasteless and odorless as rain. And you know what? I was goddamn thrilled. It was such a freakish thing she'd done. Claudia, this quiet little mermaid with her spectacles and her lisp, with her dull brown eyes, who never so much as touched herself so far as I could tell, had not only surrendered her body to me, but expelled, spumed, ejaculated some mysterious orgasmic juice all over my face. I felt like doing a victory lap around the puddle. <laughs> I know this is a, a very common experience, and so I want you to feel less alone with it because I, too, have had this experience of the Victory Lab, just once. Uh, I'll read a little bit. I was going to read a really filthy scene, and then I thought, no, it's Ames, Iowa. I'm not going to do it, unless some kind of chant goes up, and then I might consider it. Um, but it's really filthy. But this one's, this one's okay, too. It's, uh, it's from a story called How to Love a Republican, and it felt appropriate... Um, because we, we're going to have to, we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to love Republicans, and I don't think they'll love us back. But we got, you got to try. Because we want to get some things done. In this story, it was, uh, I wrote it after the the 2000. Let's just call it an election. What the heck? Um, and it was like a lot of you know crazy lefties. I was just you know wandering around in just a, a, a weird crazy rage, like psychosis. Like they can't do this. We won. We won. You know, and uh, and so I just thought you know I, I got to I've got to write something about this. And what I wanted to do, and what I really worked very hard to do, is to is to write about the place in our culture where we got to a point where it's. Um, it's, it's very difficult to actually, it was for me very difficult if somebody said they were a Republican in that particular time, and, and still to some extent today, for me to ex really feel sympathy for them and, and uh, love and empathy, what you should feel, good, good feelings, which you should have for your fellow citizen or just human being. And that's a very dangerous thing to have happened. So I thought, well, what can I do? So I, uh, I, I wrote a story in which a, a liberal guy falls in love, of course, with a... With a um, a conservative woman, and she becomes very powerful, actually. She sort of rises up through the rank in the Bush campaign. And then, of course, at the end of the election, they really have to decide to what extent you can really love somebody in the face of very fundamentally different ideas 
about what constitutes fairness. So, but I'm not going to read about any of that. I'll just read this. There's so many competing interests on the human heart. For those of us truly terrified of death, intent on leaving some kind of mark, plowing through our impatient 20s with an, in, with an agenda, there are moments when chemistry, the chemistry between bodies, the chemistry of connection, seems no more than a sentimental figment. And then something happens. You meet a woman, and you can't stop looking at her mouth. Everything she does, every word and gesture stirs inside you, strikes the happy gong. The way she lowers herself into a fresh field of snow, the delicacy of her sneezes like a candle being snuffed, the sugary sting of whiskey on her tongue, chemistry in its sensual aspects, chemistry the ultimate single issue voter. We were both tipsy and tangled in my flannel sheets. We talked about not letting this happen, this sudden rush into the secret bodies. But Darcy, her neck, the length of her torso, the wisp of corn silk above her pelvic basin, and the gentle application of her hands, her generous, unfeigned devotions to my body, which I secretly loathed, which shamed me for its deficiencies of muscle and grace, and her hair reeling across my chest. All these came at me in a tumble of violent emotion, stripped from me the language with which one crafts cautious deferrals, the maybe I should go, the sudden pause, the stuttered breath, and step back, the gallant, bonard retreat to the bathroom. Yes, bonard. <laughs> no, we made instead a ridiculous flying machine in two clamped parts in the thick of our clumsy desire, pungent and shameless. We clutched one another by the cheeks, let the skin of our bellies smack briskly, and flew. So that's what it's like to love a Republican, I say. Darcy giggled. There are other ways, too. Let's just do one way here. And it's Ames, Iowa, so I figure it's time to read an oral sex scene. Yup. It's that time. What Darcy enjoyed most was a good lathering between the thighs. I want to stress here that that gerunded verb, lather, is being used rather elastically here. What Darcy enjoyed most was a good lathering between the thighs. As a lifelong liberal, this was one of my specialties. In some obscure but plausible fashion, I viewed the general neglect of the region as a bedrock of conservatism. <laughs> the female sex was, in political terms, the equivalent of the inner city, a dark and mysterious zone, vilified by the powerful, derided as incapable of self-improvement, entrenched and smelly. Going down on a woman was a dirty business, humiliating, potentially infectious, best delegated to the sensitivos of the left. I relished the act, which I considered to be what Joe Lieberman would have termed in his phlegmy rabbinical tone, a mitzvah. Now, um, here in Ames, Iowa, uh, I might have to translate a mitzvah is like a good deed in, in Jewish. They love this in Brookline. I just get it. The rabbis, especially. It required, so uh, rabbinical tone of mitzvah, it required certain sacrifices, the deprivation of oxygen to begin with, a certain ridiculousness of posture, cramping in the lower extremities. One had to engage with the process. There were no quick fixes. Remember the Clinton? <laughs> This was especially true in Darcy's case. She was scandalized by the intensity of her desire and highly aroused by this scandal. But the going was slow. If I told her, I want to kiss you there, she would grow flustered and glance about helplessly. Just act was her point. Ditch all the soppy acknowledgement, the naming of things in the dark. And then there's some dirty stuff that I'm going to skip. It's just filthy, really. So I'm going to skip over it. She perfumed herself elaborately, which meant withstanding an initial astringency, after which she tasted wonderfully, meaning strongly of herself, the brackish bouquet of her insides. I was careful not to linger in any one spot, but to explore the entire intricate topography, the nerves flushed with blood and tingling mysteriously, while Darcy pressed herself back on the pillows and turned to face the wall and murmured the blessed, nonsensical approvals of climax. So that's just some of the filth from my life in heavy metal. Now you can see why David was on that bathroom, bath, in that toilet for so long. Uh, does that explain some things? 
Maybe many things at the same time. So I, I want to read. A, I want to read this piece of nonfiction. It's a. It's called "Heavy Metal Music Will Save Your Life." Why Tesla matters, dude. Um, are there any heavy metal fans here? Is there anyone actually awake? Okay. Are there any heavy metal fans? Don't be fucking ashamed. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, bang with me, if you would. I spent three years as a rock critic in El Paso, Texas, which was where I lived at the tail end of the 80s and where I came of age, in a sense, grew old enough, that is, to recognize that heavy metal was essentially tribal in nature, that it had everything to do with rhythm and aggression and desire and conquest and physical release and death, which is to say, with sex. But I'm not here to lecture on sex or the social mores of the headbanger subculture circa 1989. My job, as I understand it, is to suggest how heavy metal saved my life, which it surely did, and not by inspiring me toward complex thought, but by the opposite process, the complete annihilation of thought in favor of instinct. To live dangerously, absurdly, even fallaciously, this was the legacy of my metal days. To believe one might get laid, sucked off, gulped down, on any given night, anywhere on earth, a hidden stairwell, a crowded bathroom, your neighbor's porch, anywhere. But please, don't ask me, did it happen, and how, and what did she smell like, because you're missing the point. It isn't the facts I'm speaking of here, but the desire, not the deed, but the possibility. What is a piece of art, after all, but the possibility of a particular truth, and what are artists but suckers talented enough to win a few converts? So there it was for me to grab onto once a week, Metallica, Slayer, Cinderella, Poison, Vixen, Kiss, Winger, Queensryche. Yes. And there was me in my reporter's garb, garb off-brand chinos and white button-down, scribbling down song titles and adjectives in the dark while 10,000 kids, skinny boys mostly, surged and howled around me. There were girls, too, metal chicks, always with the big tits, the swirling tits, no bras, the tops pushed over their collars like pale fruit and bouncing like crazy on the balls of their feet or up on some boy's shoulders calling out for more, louder, harder, with their red, red lips. I was sure metal chicks knew how to screw, could have screwed me into the ground, and I screwed hundreds in my mind, thousands maybe, pleasuring myself in one or another of the lousy apartments I lived in back then, the basement jobs with iffy plumbing and stale air until the sweet guilt of completion softened me. That would be a reference to masturbation. <laughs> Went to see Rat headline a triple bill with Britney Fox and Kicks. I wonder, ma'am, Britney Fox or Ki Kicks? No? Familiar. Familiar, not intimate with their oeuvre. There were special bands. Britney Fox has two X's and wound up baked out of my mind because someone, some young Vato with one front tooth, handed me a joint. I was just standing there taking notes, and the joint appeared, and I did my civic duty. This was in the El Paso County Coliseum, where they held the rodeo, and the place still smelled of rodeo, burnt popcorn and the sweet, earthy reek of manure, and kicks rocked the place pretty good, far better than one might expect from a band that shares a name with an obscure cereal brand. And then Rat came on, and they had the drums rigged so that every time the drummer took a whack, the stage lights changed configuration. I was pretty sure I was watching a giant pinball game. That show was just one of many, part of something larger, what I would now refer to ingloriously as a lifestyle. Not that I got myself all snagged up in the trappings, the clothing, and the albums themselves, and the lighters. Because I was, after all, a good suburban kid from a progressive California city with a couple of parents who had dabbled in hippiedom and raised me up on a steady diet of beetles and stones, a kid who had thrown his lot in with the police and the smiths and the fix, who dabbled in prog rock, domor origato, mister rabato, but remained officially an acolyte of new wave, which seems somehow more embarrassing to admit than anything else I've told you. The point being that I thought of myself as slumming, observing El Paso's metalheads as they thrashed and banged against their own bleak prospects as they closed their eyes and hoped for a way out through the music. All this was a matter of professional duty. But I was more like those kids than I would have ever admitted to myself, as insecure about my manhood, as desperate for affirmation, as hungry for touch. 
Didn't matter that I wore skinny thrift store ties and wingtips or carried around business cards with my name printed on them. Didn't matter that I had a girlfriend who read Nietzsche's, as I pronounced it back then. <laughs> what mattered was my insides, which were in a state of continuous, riotous want. Did I mention Tesla? They were my favorite metal band, probably because they weren't even m really metal, just five burnouts from Sacramento who knew enough to play loud. The lead singer, Jeff Keith, grew up eating government-issued cheese in Broken Bow, Oklahoma. Before he joined the band, he drove a septic tank. His job was to transport rich people's shit around. He was a shit transporter. <laughs> you don't think this guy knew his way around a wish fantasy? It's interesting, there's now a blank page. Let me read it. The rest of the guys, they were all shit transporters of one sort or another. They lacked pretense because they lacked access to the world of ideas, which is the laboratory of pretense. What they knew was that life sucked most of the time, but that music, along with sex, was the only sure path to joy. I got to see Tesla only once, opening for White Snake. Went to see the show with my pal Will, a lawyer at one of the big downtown firms. We got us a bottle of MD 2020 pink grapefruit, as I recall. Do they still have that? Are you still drinking that and vomiting? <laughs> Good. And I drank the whole thing sitting on a curb outside the arena, Will still in his dark suit. We also smoked a big, flat, big fat blunt. Shit, yeah. At one point, a Latin woman, wa a blunt is a, a marijuana cigarette, usually very bulbous, large in nature. At one point, a Latin woman walked past in jeans so tight we could see everything, and Will said, Jesus, man, that's one of our paralegals. He couldn't believe that she was dressed like that right out in public. Sometimes he had to explain this kind of stuff to people like Will because they wanted to believe that El Paso was pretty much what they saw, a dried out suburb with chain restaurants and a friendly brown underclass. This was easier than facing the city as it actually existed, a head-on collision between the first and third worlds, the sort of place where the day maids had to sneak across a toxic river every morning at 6 a.m. where, if you got up early enough, you could watch the whole sad drama, the Border Patrol agents cruising around in puke green vans deciding who to deport back to the insatiable hunger of Juarez. Though actually, El Paso was what all cities are, only more so, a factory of lurid dreams. All I could think of as this woman walked past us was how much I wanted to strip those jeans off. I knew it would take some doing and hump her on the fine leather chair in Will's office. This night I'm talking about was, if memory serves, a Friday in early spring of 1989 and Will and I were juiced up on sugary wine and downtown brown and we streamed into the arena just in time to catch Tesla wailing through heaven's trail, no way out. No one was listening that carefully. They were just the opening band, relegated to the front third of the stage, looking a little naked, almost earnest up there without the fancy costumes and fireworks. But it was a beautiful thing to hear the sweet clamor of all that art. And I did manage to have sex with that paralegal. Or no, maybe it wasn't her actually, but the teller from the bank with the same dyed ringlets of hair. What I remember is the lovely curve of her in the moonlight and the desperate mashing of our wine-soaked bodies. Now, as a grown-up, well into my reasonable thirties, it would make sense enough to disown the excess of metal, the dopey hairstyles and costumes and tragically stupid lyrics. I don't listen to this stuff anymore, aside from Tesla. Never did listen to it much. But what I can't rid myself of is the yearning the dumb yearning of the body and the heart's frenzy, that sense of what might happen at any moment, the sex that might happen at any moment, the skin and the wet parts, the utter absence of shame. Metal was always about this, shameless hope, and this seems in keeping with the best spirit of rock and roll. I find it hard to get turned on listening to the minor key bombast of alt-rock, which sells us self-indulgent misery, or hip-hop, which sells us black self-immolation in a thin, shiny wrapper of self-celebration. But I still stiffen up at the sound of a good, overblown power chord. I still look around the room and try to spot any straight tits, and later, in the privacy of my own quarters, whether alone or with company, I quite happily conduct my business. Okay, Will Ames, Iowa. We've reached close to the end here. 
That was nonfiction, so allegedly true. And this is a, a, a fairly short little story that is, uh, I wanted to read it in particular because it speaks, um, it's pretty much kind of my, my ars poetica, or ass poetica, I guess, if you will. It's kind of what I think literature should do, or that's somehow in the story, what I think literature actually does for us. So those of you who are writers, are some of you guys writers? I know some of the grad students are. Can I see a show of minor tepid? So if you're, if you're writing, if you're engaged in that, that foolish, uh, noble endeavor, this is kind of my take on what, what stories are for. It's called Summer as in Love. I want to say that it was high summer. I want to say that the hydrangeas were exploding and that I was in love. None of these things was true exactly. It was nearly August and the hydrangeas were tailing off, brown veins seeping in at the edge of the purple clusters. But you see, this was one of those perfect summer days, the kind that burns off all the inconvenient truths. And I was in Vermont with my new lover, Lil Thorne, and we had risen hot with sleep, slippery in the rude places, desperate to start rutting again. Oh, how we rutted rutted and gasped and tried not to breathe our rotten breath onto one another. And then toward nine, Lil shambled to the kitchen with her big lovely strawberry of an ass bouncing after her and fetched us some juice. And we gulped that down and let the fructose rev our blood and licked each other until our skin turned ticklish. It was summer, our first summer, our only summer in the grass and the grass was the color of straw, and the oaks on the hilltops wore skirts of black shadow, and the lake down below us was an absurd milky blue. Eons ago, a glacier had passed through the surrounding valley, dug out an alluvial trough, which filled with runoff from the winter snows. The water was warm for one month a year, and we were in the midst of that month, lodged in the house of a friend who had left us his key with a note instructing us not to stain any of the furniture. It was about our only agenda. Don't stain the furniture. We were students of literature that summer, Lil and I, and we brought more books than clothing. Summer was the time to catch up on the reading lists. Our duffels were crammed with Stendhal and Gaskell and James. There was always some book we should have been reading, though we were in the thick of our inaugural lust, bulletproof and glowing with sun, streaked in tanning lotion and dried sweat. We were still reading for ideas back then, for style. We hadn't figured out what literature was for, actually, that it was mostly about loss, that without hope there was no risk, and without risk there was no danger, and that every story in the end is about danger. We still believed literature could be reasoned with, I mean. Lil looked like this, tall, fleshy, with crooked teeth and a gently scalloped underlip. She'd found me somewhere at some party and showed me her tattoo. I was certainly ready for a major disruption. By noon, we had staggered down to the lake, down the steep, rickety wooden stairs that led to the dock with its quaint boathouse, where, of course, we had done it the previous day, Lil atop a bed of orange life preservers, the scent of rotting beams and boat fuel drifting down onto our sweet, salty merger and the spider webs rising like faint scars with our exertions. There was a wooden float a hundred yards out, and we swam out there with books held over our heads, Gatsby for me and the lover for Lil. She was insatiable after doomed love, though she said she read Dura because she liked the way the author shaped her thoughts. I was stuck on Daisy Buchanan, winsome and cruel, gazing tearfully down at Gatsby's shirts, all those lovely silk collars. We lay on our backs and held the books up to shade our eyes, and we might have gazed at the pages, absorbed a paragraph or two, but that was it. One of us would shift our weight, and the raft would sway, and the other would reach out. We could feel the erotic intent transmitted through the fingertips, and the books would fall away. In the afternoon, famished, dizzy, we drove to the country store and bought smoked ham and rolls and chocolate bars and brie cheese, which we slathered onto a frozen pizza. So I guess there's also a, a kind of a cookbook element to this. It's a little recipe for you. Then we curled up and slept for a few hours and rose in time to watch the shadows of the trees drawn across the lake. Lil wanted to swim. She ran down the stairs in shorts and one of my long-sleeved shirts. 
I might have noted her precarious gait, the way she nearly stumbled on each step, but her tits were in an uproar, swirling all around. A little clumsiness didn't strike me as any great problem. She landed on the dock almost drunkenly and pulled the shirt off and kicked off her shorts, and she was naked there for a moment, tall as a tree and solid, before leaping into the water. There was no one watching, no one who would have said anything. It was one of those lakes. Folks didn't buy houses here to spy or complain, but to remove themselves from their duties to the poor. Lil dove down and her body jackknifed. Her bottom broke the surface for a blessed moment. She stayed under for a minute at least, then rose near the shore with her hair dripping onto her chest. Oh, that chest, that water, those pale swollen hips which shone against her sunburn. I was astounded at my good fortune, mistrustful, unsure what I'd done to deserve Lil. I thought surely I would be the one who made too much of our affair, forgot that it was summer, just a summer thing. And then dusk fell around us and we were into the wine, deep into the wine, two Chiantis straight from the bottle and thick as blood. It was a kind of greed that Lil made essential. Perhaps she knew what was happening inside her, that certain crucial circuits were, even then, fizzing out. What I remember, though, is the sunlight lancing down from the stubbled brown ridges, falling across Lil as she fell against the railing of the stairs and down below the lake, burnished in gold. The color of nostalgia, I can see that now, though at the time it was only a dappled backdrop for our next sex act. Lil took a sip of wine and her hands were trembling and she reached back to sweep up her fine mass of black hair to show me the delicate blue butterfly tattooed on the nape of her neck and to lift her breasts to my caress. She stumbled a little, her knees buckled. I thought it must have been the wine, the sun, our long day of ardor. She was wearing my shirt again. It was one of my father's old shirts, actually and she reached down to undo the buttons, and her hands were still trembling. She wanted to undress for me, there against the rail, and her fingertips played at the top button. She tried to coax the button through the hole once, twice, three times. I thought she was being coy, prolonging the act, but then suddenly she was in tears, and I said, what is it? What is it, sweetie? And she just shook her head and said, no, nothing, nothing, I'm just so happy and tried once again to fumble the button through the tiny stitched hole. I reached out to help her, but she pushed my hands away, and her eyes were just a second flash. Let me do it, she said. I can do it. She laughed a little, tried to laugh, but then she was weeping again, more quietly now, and I thought of Daisy bent in obeisance over those helpless shirts, and how happy it made men to see a woman, a beautiful woman in particular, weep. And just a little later, when we'd managed to rid ourselves of clothes, she clung to me until we were both choked of air. But when I asked her what it was all about, she only shook her hair and bit my neck. I couldn't have known. She was a beautiful young woman after all, big and pink and vital, and it was summer. You don't think about such things in summer. You're in love. You think you're in love. And then summer ends, and the chilly breath of autumn comes out of the east, and the flags of skin get folded into sweaters, and it gets worse. The shaky hands, the stumbling, the mood swings, until finally, just before Christmas, she names the thing. And it's some disease you've seen on posters, some breakdown in the muscles. One of your teachers in junior high had the same thing, Mrs. Rolfe. And you can still remember the way her head shook at the chalkboard, and you teasing her behind her back. Who was it who pulled away from whom? I still can't keep it straight. There weren't any scenes, any blow-ups. We simply agreed to let the affair run down. She made it easy for me. No talk of loyalty, duty, the things I might have done. It was only that one day I couldn't rid myself of. The golden varnish of summer, which, rather than ebbing, ebbing away as the white glare of winter took us under, grew warm and encompassing. Lil moved on, staggered off to a new program, and later, I heard, to an experimental clinic run by a doctor in Mexico. But I was still snagged in that summer idol, the sun, the clear blue water, her skin. It was my punishment. 
We never think about such days as they're happening. We never consider what it means that Daisy is weeping over those shirts, feeling her betrayal before she's enacted it. We never read a book for its deepest human lesson, not in summer. Instead, we close our eyes and let our lovers step toward us through the fading hydrangeas, the impenetrable dusk, and when their hands tremble, we take them in ours and pledge never to leave them, not now, not ever. Even as the summer ends and the books take on their true, cruel weight, this is the story we tell ourselves, and I would trade every word in the English language for the chance, right now, once again, to believe. That's it. So, um, if there are questions, I guess if there are, if people do have questions, feel free to ask them, um, and please don't be embarrassed. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to sit here in a kind of awkward silence for like ten minutes, which I can do, but I'm worried about you. You have a question, sir? Yes, uh, a <laughs> couple of them, actually. Uh, I want to apologize because I, I was covering an event next door and I didn't get into here the early part of your... Uh, it was filthy, but okay. <laughs> well, frankly, I guessed as much, and, although I enjoyed it uh, after a fashion. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I, I, I came tonight because I, uh, I was tremendously impressed by your... Uh, by the piece that you wrote about your resignation from uh, uh, uh -huh. uh, from BU, BC, or, right? BC. BC. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Sure. Two very different schools. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I, I lived in Boston. I, I know that. Uh, uh, and I don't hear. It may be just the selections you read, but I don't hear in the things that you read tonight uh, a great deal of. of uh, political, politi that kind content. of political content, and I'm, sure. I'm wondering if you would just speak to uh, what exactly the question is: what exactly does your or did your resignation from BU have to do with with your writing? Okay, well, it's a good question. I, w I will say that uh, you know s stories are not uh, polemics, and, and it's. For instance, I read an excerpt, I don't know whether you heard from a story called How, Lo How to Love a Republican, which was, um, I guess, about as political as my fiction gets. But, and, and when I originally wrote that story in the wake of the 2000 election, it had about uh, 14,000 words, 15,000 words, a very long story. About 7,000 of those were my uh, anguish and outrage at what I saw as a complete corruption of the democratic process. Unfortunately, that's not really an interesting story. People don't really want to hear about that. There's, that's about my rage, not about, in some ways, my heartbreak. So um, I retained a little bit of the political commentary in that, but it was primarily about what happens when the person that you love, you don't respect. You don't respect their political views and you don't respect their morality, which felt to me like the the really complicated human question that, that comes out of, uh, of these political um, dramas. But to answer your question about this resignation from BC, that was an act that I undertook as a citizen because I felt that um, there were very few opportunities we have in this country where everybody's kind of numbed out on TV and, and people don't tend to behave um, morally in a public way. For me to say, you know BC, uh, you know, this woman was responsible for this horrible war where so many Americans, never mind the Iraqis, but just so many Americans are being killed and injured. It was predicated on lies that you propagated, and it is dis despicable to me that my school would, would, would say to the graduating seniors, These, this woman is your moral exemplar. Work really hard, and you can be on the board of Exxon and have an oil tanker named after you. And when a bunch of people are drowning in New Orleans, she'll be off, uh, you know, shoe shopping for Ferragamo fucking pumps. That's, that is not the person who should be speaking to graduating seniors about the, the way to lead a moral life. 
it's just it's it's not compassionate. It's it's deeply fraudulent. And they they made that decision. BC made that decision, you know, because they wanted a good PR opportunity, just as this school might do it. You know, she's an incredibly intelligent, accomplished woman of color. She is in many ways a great role role model, but her morality is is out the window. It's awful. So, and ultimately, that's what she was being set up as. You know, a moral exemplar. So. I don't think that has anything to do with my identity as a writer, but I will say that part of the role of artists in this culture is to sp speak about morality and people's, um, people's indi indifference to other people's suffering. And I do think that uh, even though I want to tell important stories that are deeply personal, I try to get in my, my shots if I can in a story like the one I just read, which is really about the nature of doomed love and the way in which we betray the people that we are supposed to love uh, and betray ourselves in that process, there's a little comment about what kind of lake they are going to. It's the kind of lake where rich people remove themselves from their duties to the poor. It's not a big deal. It's just a little commercial for the better angels of our nature slipped into the body of the story. And that's, I think, kind of the best you can do because if you are arguing with whoever you're trying to speak to, you're making rhetoric. And, you know, art and poetry resides in the argument with yourself, your own failings, uh, you know, y your own weakness, and your own capacity to disregard other people's suffering, right, and ignore your own sin. So, in that sense, I'm always trying to pull back from being too polemic in my work, because frankly, people just, it turns people off. It does not inv invite them, and ultimately it doesn't implicate them. And this is the thing when people say, rah, 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 you know, uh, when they try to morally instruct you, instinctively, I think people flinch against that and say, just don't tell me how you think it should be, because who fucking gave you the badge? So that's, that's my sense, is that you're, you're best to write about your own failings and weaknesses and hope that other people, it, it brings people to that level of humility and self-awareness within themselves. So. Uh. I don't. I don't want to uh, keep anybody else from answering asking a question. But uh, okay. since I'm the only one up here, I'm <laughs> going to go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, and in a conversational tone, I mean, I'm, I'm not wouldn't be argumentative mm -hmm. because uh, I agree with you. But uh, Flannery O'Connor managed to write fiction that that wasn't polemical, but but that actually. Uh, all writers do. Crime and punishment. You know, I mean, every great book, Catcher in the Rye for that matter, is a powerful moral statement. I don't think my stories are quite at that level, but I think any time an artist is trying to make the reader, a writer is trying to make a reader feel more than they did before, that's a political act. Bottom line, that is a, the, the most essential basic political act that you can undertake. That's what makes TV and film in this country so pornographic and, and emotionally sickening to me, is that it is trying to make us feel less about, for instance, dead bodies, of which there is no end if you turn on the TV or go to movies. And rather than feeling the great tragedy of when somebody dies, you feel, oh, well, how did they die? Well, maybe some haughty investigator will figure it out and the mystery will be solved. But death is an occasion of mourning. And, and self-reflection, right? So my larger point is the political action resides in making people feel more, awakening their mercy, not towards any particular agenda, just towards being morally responsible as a citizen of, the, of this country and as a you know, citizen, member of the species. It's, it's extremely important at this point because I think things are going to get very dark. You know? And you guys have 60 years left. I've got 40, maybe. My little daughter has 80, so it's very important to me that we, that we start, start to shape up. And I do think artists play a, a central role in that. I think they need to be more insistent about it. That's why I used my position at BC to try to um, make, a, make a kind of moral statement. So, yeah, well, those, are, those are great questions. I'll just answer a couple more if other people have them. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you sort of seem to make it differentiation between pornography and film. Um, <laughs> I do. I do. Uh, you, uh, let, me, let, me, let me tell you my take on it. Pornography is interested in your glands. 
It's interested in, in mostly men, but, uh, but also women, um, in, in getting you physically excited. Food network for women. Food network for women. Food network for me, frankly, sir. That stuff is, that stuff is, is very exciting to me. Gastro porn. But, um, and, and, and filth or erotica or the kind of stuff I write, um, I am interested in, in um, the sensual ecstatic experience of, of sexual congress. But I'm mostly interested in it as an emotional and psychological experience. The great tragedy of the culture that we have created for ourselves is that you guys can see as much weird, fucked up, crazy violence as you could possibly want, but you can't see a nipple. You can't see uh, two people engaged in any kind of realistic sexual congress. And of course, people are just by nature of our biology and, and our hearts thinking a great deal about their own sexuality, their desires, and that experience is embarrassing and uh, uh, incredibly satisfying and guilt-provoking and ridiculous and absurd and comic. It's all those things and, and incredibly sensual. I mean, every sense is appealed to, your tactile, your, right? So when people are surprised that I write a lot about sexuality, I want to say, well, what the fuck are you writing about? I mean, we think about it a lot. It's a natural part of our cogitation, and not just because we're all horn dogs, but because we have big, thumping hearts filled with desires for, you know, to, to find the emotional, phys the physical release, certainly, but also the, uh, the, the comfort and nurturance that comes with, you know, getting with somebody or even getting with yourself. Um, so uh, I, I guess that's the distinction I make. Pornography is really just appealing to your glands and what I consider to be good, uh, you know, sexy writing is, is, is doing that, some of that work, but is also interested in exploring what the, emo what the experience is really like. There's so few representations. It's sad because you could make some great film or, you know, it, if you somewhere between porn and the bullshit where they always cut away or the woman always is wearing a bra or she's got the you know the sheet over her boobs you know that's not how sex really is we know it's much more interesting and tr disturbing and beautiful and and risky dangerous than that and you never get to see it hollywood just can't do it they cannot really represent the truth of what our experience is and that's a great pity because it's one of the most profound human experiences we can have. So this, these scenes I write are try, trying to, in their own limited way, trying to capture what it's really like. So maybe one more question if you guys have another question. It should be abundantly clear that I'll answer any question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I made a lot of it. I, I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about. Well, wh you know, what I make of that is that you know she is. She's his his uh, office wife. She's his office wife. You know, he's got Laura to fulfill the traditional da da da, and you know, she's she's his office wife. But I'll tell you that I do think that these strange. Um, I mean, these politicians have deep personal psychologies themselves. I'll tell you what I made of Monica Lewinsky. What I think was happening with Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton was in part, aside from him abusing his power and you know getting horny and all the obvious stuff, I think he, he deeply loved his daughter, Chelsea. He was very, very involved with her life. And she just had left home. She'd gone off to Stanford. And I think part of the function that Monica Lewinsky played in Bill Clinton's psychology was not as the daughter he wanted to screw, but as the young woman that he could play a nurturant role to. He, he after all, did give her Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. You know? His role with her, in other words, was not exclusively a sexual thing. And if you read the Star Report, guilty as charged, you can see that part of his dynamic towards her is this strange, almost paternal tenderness. So, you know, I mean, I really do think about um, the psychology that's behind these sort of lurid headlines. That's what's interesting to me. Michael Jackson, there's a story in B.B. Chow called The Idea of Michael Jackson's Dick. And it's about Michael Jackson's dick, and it's about our fetishizing 
of him. And it's about the way in which Michael Jackson represents, really, he's the ch chief symptom of the national disease. If ever there was, a, remember Michael Jackson when he was five years old, five, six years old, amazing young artist, unbelievable. I mean, you hear those songs and it's like, what? He could just do it. And something happened to him, a whole series of things happened to him. The, the contagion of the American lust for fame and our pathologies about race uh, and sexuality and sexual orientation just landed on that guy's head and turned him into this strange creature who is, in fact, not a freak, but an indictment of how freaky we are. So, anyway, I'll, I will end on that very strange note. Thank you guys for listening. I'm happy to sign books and hang out. So. Thank <laughs> you.